So if you'd be kind enough, really, Phil, uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experiences with dystonia. Uh, I'm sure some of the band don't even know what focal dystonia is. Maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about that, if you'd be kind enough to do that. Dystonia is something I never thought would happen to me. And to be honest with you, I can't tell you why it happened. I, I don't know. I'm not sure anyone... To be honest, I don't want to listen to anyone try to tell me why they think it happened. I've heard, I've read, even from us, even from someone that, uh, who, in, in, my, in my coming through dystonia, and, and let me be clear, I have not conquered dystonia. I, I am continually trying to find a way through it. Um, but in my, in my process, I, I went to a lady, a lovely lady by the name of Jan Kagerice, um, who gave me a lot of information, a lot of information. And then I started to read from other people because I still felt like I was struggling. And I'm thinking, well, let me, let me search out other people. So I went to someone like uh, Lucinda Lewis, who, who has a book entitled Ambrosur um, Rehabilitation. Um, I went to other people that had different things to say about it. I really read as much as I could about it. Um, and at a certain point, I sort of came to the decision, well, I've got a lot of information. It's a little bit like learning to play. You get a lot of people tell you to do this, that, the other. There comes a time when you have to sit there and kind of figure out your journey for yourself. And you have to kind of go at it yourself. And I've sort of gone at it that way. Um, but I've had someone <laughs> say to me that I read or refer, not say to me, that someone referred of my case of being uh, people struck with dystonia are inefficient players. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think I could have done my career as an inefficient player. Something else happened. And so I, I, can't, I can't go there. Now, can the result be inefficiency? Yes. And you're trying to find a way through this. Can you get, and, and can, it, can it become too tense? I mean, for me, dystonia was something letting go on this upper left side. In fact, I can remember with one of the last recordings I did, an album that uh, the Salvation Army has released called Trilogy. It has my first CD that I did, the first LP that I did with Joe Turin. It has one that I did with Bram Tovey and GUS band, and uh, they were called Rigid Containers at the time. Sure. And it has a new one, which was my last, and it's the hymns, the unreleased hymn tracks. And as I was doing that, that was about a year or two, probably two years before I got hit with the stone here. I can remember the, the, the uh, sound guy saying, um, I hear hissing. Is, is there hissing there? Is there a mic making noise? No, what it was is this was letting loose and I was having to let, to let go. And at that time I could shut it down. I could make it work. Yeah. So there was something that became inefficient where I was making my mouth tighter to, to hold this. Does that create inefficiency? Yes. Um, so where am I going with this? My struggle is perpetual. I've learned different things. It's certainly affected how I teach. There's things that I did as a player that I would not do now. I'm like, for instance, you know, I was a, I was a good mouthpiece buzzer. Okay. And I would practice in the car an hour and a half to work. I'd be playing all of this repertoire on the mouthpiece. Yeah. Um, but that isn't how we play. And I can prove that to you by you going and watching a site on YouTube by John Harbour, H-A-R-B-A-U-G-H. Uh, he's from the University of Washington on the West Coast, and it's called Trumpet Physics. He can make a glass tube that's three foot long and as big around as that. He can make a glass tube play a note. Well, that glass tube doesn't have any lips, but it's energized air through the tube that creates vibrancy and creates sound, and that creates a foghorn sound. Okay, here we go. All right. So we'll bring the lights down, and then I'll take that so I don't burn you. Okay. All right, so you can see the flame 
It's quite long. Let's see what happens when we put it in the tube. We're going to energize the air molecules in this tube. And we have a what now? We got a sound. Was anything buzzing or vibrating? There's nothing going on here except we have energized those air molecules, okay? Now, watch the flame and tell me what happens to the flame. What's it doing? What it's happened? Going yeah, the flame's going berserk. It's getting short. It's really active, okay? So the last question is, we do have a sound. We know that the flame is interacting with something. What happens first, the sound or the flame going berserk? What happened first, Casey? Sound happened first, okay? So you've just witnessed, could you take that, Steve? What uh, the July 1973 Scientific American article states by Arthur Bernard, uh, if I can quote Bernard, it says, a trumpet produces musical tones when the vibrations of the player's lips interact with the standing waves in the instrument. These waves are generated when acoustic energy is sent back by the instrument's bell. So we know then that the lips move sympathetic to the standing wave, or we don't have to make the lips go. I was doing a clinic and one of the uh, people in the audience asked me, well, if that's how this thing works, how do you get a sound? What makes the lips go? And I said, I don't really know, but I'm going to go ask uh, one of the physics professors here on campus. So he explained it this way to me. He took a flat surface, and he put a piece of paper over the top of it, and he did this little simple experiment. Now what happened? The paper lifted, okay? Or what we did actually is create a low pressure, and that brought the paper up. Okay, if you notice, the paper is, has no tension in it. It's very relaxed, okay? And he said, this is exactly what happens when you blow across relaxed lips, that they start to move as a result of that low pressure, but it happens in a millisecond, and at the same time, which we watch with the tube, that standing wave's coming back, and that's what energizes those lips. But I'm not doing this to make them go. They are simply going as a result of the physical activity inside that little mouthpiece or big mouthpiece, whatever you have. So that's, a, that's another concept uh, that, again, I got from a physicist. It's, it's how the crazy thing works, and you can do, you can address playing the trumpet in many, many different ways. This is one concept that comes from, from physics, and I hope it becomes a, a tool that you can use in your uh, development as a player, right? Okay, there was another article. And so that is what needs to happen. So when I first was practicing with Jan, she tried, the first thing she did was get me off the horn. And that's why it's retraining. Yeah. You can't keep, I used to say, but Jan, I have to do this. She said, no, no, we're retraining. And it was just blow a candle. Now, just blow through the mouthpiece. Blow through a pipe. She actually handed me straws from big slurpy straws from big thick ice cream yeah, milkshake. Yeah. Just big slurpy straws. Just direct the air through that straw. Throw it to the back in the. Yeah, down the pipe, on the lead pipe. Just think of this as a, as a brass straw, or a silver straw, or a gold straw. Get away from the horn. Wait a minute. I have to lick my lips. No, you know. Wait, wait. It's, like, it's like the batter that comes up. You, they, they probably do this in cricket, right? They come up, they kick the dirt, they move their hips around, they do all kinds of things before they hit the ball, right? None of that has anything to do with hitting the ball. But that's just the routine that they go through. And this is just, it's playing an instrument, a brass instrument, is air through lips that vibrate. Just put the mouthpiece over the aperture 
And I would go, well, that's not how I play. I, I used to twist my lips. And I don't, I don't want to talk about that. Let's not, let's not go there. Let's just. Right. Well, the first time that came out without any air coming out of here, I was like, holy smoke, something is, wow. that's unique. Now, how do I get to the next note? I didn't know. And I've had to retrain myself to go through that whole process. Um, do I still drift back into my old ways of playing? Yes. And when I do, it doesn't work. It falls apart. And so there are times, there are elements, I have to keep it very simple. Air through lips that vibrate. To keep my lips further apart, I, I said to her many times, I feel like I could stick my pinky in the aperture. I feel like my aperture is so open. She says, that's okay. That's fine. Because you're, you will figure out you will figure out how to make that work. Just as Federer, Federer, didn't, Federer wasn't taught, grab the racket this way. He found out how efficiency worked and that's, that worked for him. So you will figure this out. You have to go forget what you know. You almost know too much. In fact, you do know too much. Go back to being seven and not knowing anything and just start to play again. And that's what I've had to do. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that i know that's going to be helpful to people who are listening and watching and that's just a brilliant so taking us through that's amazing uh and you must be